Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Up next, Dr. Shelley Kerr joins us with her latest work, Past Lives in Ancient Lands and Other Worlds, of which I had the pleasure of writing the foreword to her book. We'll be back with Shelley in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back. George Norrie with you for more than two decades. Shelley Kerr, Ph.D., has worked with thousands of people around the planet, helping them achieve greater peace and happiness in their own lives. A world-renowned past life regressionist, Dr. Shelley's methods of combining energy work with hypnosis has been endorsed by numerous leaders in the field of consciousness, including near-death experience pioneer Dr. Raymond Moody and Dr. Brian Weiss. She received her doctorate of philosophy in parapsychic science from the American Institute of Holistic Theology back in 2001, has been a regular guest here on Coast to Coast, and her latest book is called Past Lives in Ancient Lands and Other Worlds. Dr. Shelley Kerr, back on Coast to Coast. Hi, Shelley. Hey, George. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. I hope you are, too. I am doing great. It's great to be with you. Great book, by the way. You hit a home run with this one. Thank you so much, and thank you for your support of this one. I really appreciate it. You, I'm excited about you it. You deserve it. It's, you did a great job. And what do we learn from the ancient lands that could help us today? Well, there's so many things. Um, when we dive into these ancient lands specifically, I think we get a lot more information about our soul, where we fit in in history, what our purpose is, and, and just all kinds of things by diving in a little deeper in this book. What made you decide to look at the ancient times? I was on Coast to Coast earlier. We were talking about that series that I did on the ancient Egyptians, and I was talking to students about the gnomes of ancient Egypt, which were the ancient city-states, um, the deities that were different maybe in um, Heliopolis. And then we talked about Memphis, Triad, Thebes, and Hermopolis. And when we would do guided imagery journey, and I would bring the historical context into the work rather than just taking people into regressions, the details that they were able to recall about their former lives were so much um, clearer and so much more specific than anything that I'd ever experienced before. So I really wanted in this new book to start saying, well, everybody knows I loved Egypt, of course, but what if we went in and really started giving historical context to a lot of the different places in the ancient world, sprinkled in with some of the bazillions of uh, stories that I've been hearing over the last 20 plus years, so that readers can really start to dive in and and ask themselves, wow, you know, is maybe I lived here, or, or maybe this is intriguing, or and so we can find places where we need to heal. Um, and, and again, just trying to help people find out, like, who are you really at your soul essence based on the places that you've been in past lives? Shelley, in addition to ancient Egypt, what other lands uh, have we looked at here? Here we've gone beyond that. Um, the book is really begins at the beginning of history, so we start with prehistory hunter-gatherers in some very um, primitive settings. We go to Mesopotamia, Babylon, and the Persian Empire, which I've never discussed before. Of course, yes, Egypt, um, but I divide Egypt this time a lot more um, diligently, let's say, into the old, the middle, the new kingdom, into the Ptolemaic period of Cleopatra, one of our favorite discussions, I know. And then we go into the ancient Greece, but we also go into the Minoans, the Mycenaeans, ancient Europe, Celts and Druids and Vikings, um, the Americas. We have to talk about the Mayans, that's very popular, Peru and others in the Americas, um, ancient Rome, Asia, and Australia. You talk a lot about past life regression in these works. How important is that? It became very important to me um, personally years ago when I had unresolved grief, and I was looking high and low for relief from that, and it, it really helped me 
to come to a different understanding about difficulties that I was having in my current existence. I, I always get asked about this, like, aren't we supposed to be in the here and now and, and trying to make the best out of this moment? And I agree that we should be doing that. But I also had done some research about the idea that we're here minding our business, but these unwanted influences come in from from different places, whether we're traveling or we meet people we've known in previous lifetimes and things like that. And so it brings up these opportunities for us to heal. And sometimes um, the source of some of our difficulties that we're facing in this life come from past lives. You know, we don't always look there first, but a lot of the people I've worked with over the years, have maybe it's a last resort, but they finally think, well, you know what? I'm having these difficulties. They don't seem to be getting any better. Maybe we better try past lives, and so I think that's one of the reasons why people um, look at it if it's if it's something that needs to come up to help you heal and yes, make this present moment the best that it can be. Shelley, how difficult or how easy is it to get people ready for their past life regressions? I think it depends on the person, but I I've worked with so many people now. You know, everybody expects that if we're going to go into past lives that we need to be one of these super visual people. And so I try to speak with students and readers to talk them through the concept that not everyone is going to have really um, technicolor to vivid memories and visions and things. So sometimes we hear an inner voice or sometimes we have inner feelings and thoughts. And so all of my guided journeys are in books and things are divided so that we can start you know, engaging with which modality. Do we see pictures? Do we have thoughts? Are we having feelings? The other thing in this book and others I've been trying to bring up is if we're going to take the time to do these journeys and to go into the past, it's a really good idea to get a journal out. That could be an app in your phone. It could be a document, a paper journal, or even a few pieces of paper just to write down some of the things that we're bringing up. And then just learning how to open the mind to imaginative thoughts, to creating relaxation, um, creating our sacred space in our physical world. And then I create, I help people create like a space where we walk through a door and we go into a sacred space in their mind's eye. And then they keep returning to that space again and again and again. So it becomes very, very easy. But this is kind of like exercising a muscle. I mean, we need to get used to the, the idea and just continue the process of doing it uh, becomes easier and easier over time with a little bit of prep work up front. Shelly, dream experts recommend a journal, too, that when you wake up with a dream, write it down right away. Why does that work? It is really strange. You know, um, the dream imagery is so foreign to our conscious mind that if we blink or go have a cup of coffee, it seems that it's gone or we don't quite remember exactly how it is. So this is ex very, very similar to what we're talking about in the dream state. Um, when you're in that trance state and I'm asking you different questions that you probably haven't been asked before, these pictures, thoughts, and feelings start to bubble up, very similar to dream imagery. And it, you, it is something that you'd want to take down and take notes of right away because down the road, you could be having a piece to a puzzle that's really going to unlock some kind of personal understanding for yourself. So it's good to keep track. You've talked about virtual reality. Tell us how that mixes in with this. Yeah, I, uh, I started talking to readers up front as well about something that is, I guess it's a different way for me to be thinking about it than I would have 20 years ago, let's say, that one of the ways we're going to start remembering who we've been in past lives would be through watching programming, whether that's on the History Channel, the Discovery Channel, or whether that's even picking up a pair of virtual reality goggles. We can travel all over the world now in virtual reality, and we can start to find places that are either intriguing or maybe they're a little bit spooky. And virtual reality really gives us an opportunity to see things up close and personal in a way that we can't even do probably when we're visiting these sites, you know. And it can be very, very helpful for beginning the processes of starting to open up the subconscious mind to all of the memories of past lives that are stored within the depths of the soul. Why is there this apparent blockage of past lives in humans? The Greeks believed that we dipped 
into a river of forgetfulness because the idea is that we want to come here as a blank slate and we want to learn lessons through experience. It would seem that if we did know all of the things that we had experienced as souls, maybe life could be easier. It might be more overwhelming. I mean, I have encountered a few people who believe that they did not dip into that river and they do have memories of they claim when they were babies and things like that. But, you know, for most of us, we just simply don't remember. I, I think it also speaks to psychology. Psychologists believe that we can really only hold seven chunks of information mm -hmm. in our consciousness. So we would really get sensory overload. And I, I personally believe we're all having sensory overload right now anyway with all of the content that we're consuming. So there's just really only, only so much we can digest at any given time. Why is it so important to go back and get those past lives? If there's something that's really troubling you, or let's say we're at a crossroads, which everyone's going to be at some point or another, and we want to know what's next or what are my gifts and talents, you know, sometimes we can't get in touch with these things just through three-dimensional consciousness in our current reality. And when we go back into the past, there's usually a story we're telling, so we can go back, let's say, I always tell people there's usually just three things we're working on, love and relationships, health or security and abundance, prosperity, creating money. So let's say we're going for a relationship issue, we go into a past situation, and we can say, oh my gosh, look, so-and-so is there. We're doing the same things in this past life, and we're doing them the same here. So if the things we're doing in the past are helping us and they feel beneficial, then let's keep doing more of them, and let's figure out how to do that. But as is always, or let's say quite possibly um, often the case, we need to make changes to that behavior. So by just getting up above a problem and seeing it through a different vantage point, we can come into the now, make those changes, and then move on feeling peaceful and, and moving forward in our lives. Shelley, where does spirit guides or angels come in? It is super helpful for people to connect with a guide or a guardian angel of some kind before going on these journeys. So when we're doing our setup, we're relaxing ourselves, we're walking through a doorway into a sacred space that we've created. And while there, we're going to meet with a beautiful angel, a guide. It could be an ancestor. It could be a deceased friend or a loved one. It's just going to be somebody who loves you. They have your back. They know every single thing there is to know about your soul. And then this comes into play if people are having difficulties. Let's say they're not a visual person. Then their guide is going to go with them. And so we can ask the guide, okay, so what's happening here? Or the guide can show them things. The guide can hold their hand and take them through the journey. And it just makes it easier for people to process. And it's just very comforting. Do we all have spirit guides or angels? I believe we do, yes. And I think they come in all kinds of different forms. I mean, people have deceased loved ones who look out as loving angels. I believe in guardian angels. I've, I've seen mine in this space that I'm describing. Um, and I think we have different spirit guides, beings of light, who are helping us absolutely. Well, sometimes miraculous things, uh, Shelley, happen to people. And I do believe that the uh, angels or guardian angels have stepped in to help that and make that happen. But there are cases where bad things happen to good people and no one steps in to help them. Why? That is a great question. You know, I think that's a, a very big philosophical question. Like, why do bad things happen to good people? And I don't think any of us really understand that for sure. Um, there's journeys in my book where we talk about taking people to a space before they incarnated in this current lifetime where they can meet with God, creator, source, and and say, hey, God, you know, what, if, what is the plan here? What's the action plan for this thing that I'm getting ready to do in my current life? And so sometimes we can get those answers there. I do think that sometimes when we go through difficult times, we end up obviously learning lessons, and we definitely become more empathetic towards others in a way that I don't know that we would have been. Because unfortunately, as I know you know, people typically learn better through having hard times. If we're having really good times, usually we're just sitting on the beach relaxing. But if something's challenging, then we tend to dig in and, 
and go on a journey to try to learn. And so I think it's one of the ways we learn, too. You have keyed in on Lemuria and Atlantis. Tell us about that. Yes. Um, I love to talk about Lemuria. I first learned about Lemuria many, many years ago. I wrote a book about Hawaii, and there were um, stories about the lost continent of Mu, which was supposedly a fictitious place, but it was also in the ancient lore of the people there um, in island settings. And so in my career earlier, you know, I wrote a lot of book about books about gem and mineral healing. And so I wrote one about the Lemurian seed crystals with this idea that these Lemurians are some kind of interdimensional extraterrestrials who are coming through and they're bringing loving energies to planet Earth. Um, the idea of Lemuria was, of course, popularized also recently by Edgar Casey, who recorded a lot of people who had past lives in Lemuria. He said this was the civilization that predated Atlantis. It was also mentioned by Madame Lavatsky. Mm-hmm. And so in the Casey readings, one of the things Edgar Casey spoke about was the fact that there was a time when we were living as non-corporal beings. We were just little space bubbles out in the universe, and then we decided to, to incarnate into this land of Lemuria, the idea being that this was a very peaceful space, everyone was loving each other, everything was harmonious, and then as Earth changes and different things migrated these beings to different areas, then I believe they've merged at some points with the Atlanteans, and then it gave rise to the Atlantean civilization, which was a, diff- uh, a different, uh, more advanced civilization that had all of the luxuries in the world, but basically misused their power and were eventually destroyed. And this is also another big part of the Edgar Casey life readings. You know, just warning people, I think, that Lemuria is like a utopia, something we might strive for, whereas Atlantis is more of that cautionary tale. And the idea that many people who are living today may be reincarnated Atlanteans, and so we're back here on Earth. We're trying to see if we're going to do it right this time. And I certainly hope we do. Is there an ancient land that is more important than another? I think that would depend on each individual, um, depending on what it is that they're resonating with. One of the reasons why I'm proposing people go through this material a couple of times, when they read Ancient Lands and Other Worlds, if they could read it the first time kind of as an entertainment then that's when it starts to stimulate the mind as to what information is interesting to me, what is making the hair on the back of my neck stand up and it's terrorizing me, and then they can start to tune in at a soul level to what is going to be important to them individually and then go back and say, okay, well, now I want to dive into ancient Greece or now I want to look at the Mesopotamians. So I think that answer has to be kind of an individual thing. But you don't think there's a specific area that is more important than another? Um, I personally go through different times when I'm tuning into some of them more than others. Right now, the Roman Empire is coming up a lot for me. I think, um, you know, we're here in the United States living in a republic as we were in Greece, as the Romans were. And I think it's very a very interesting time, as you know. So that's been one that I've personally kind of tuned into myself. I've been also super fascinated by Mesopotamia, just when we think about the fact that we have so many more written documents of Mesopotamia, but if we talk about, like, marketing, you know, Egypt is the most popular ancient destination now, and everybody puts a lot of emphasis on that, and I think, you know, obviously I have as well. I think that one of the interesting things about just looking at some of these different areas that you may not be as familiar with, you start to find some resonance there and you can really learn a lot of new things, not only about your soul, but just about the world at large. Like where have we come from as a humanity and and what were we learning back then and how different ancient peoples handled things can be pretty helpful, I think. In your book, Past Lives in Ancient Lands and Other Worlds, you have discussed the possibility of people who believe they were aliens in other lives. Tell me about that. Yes. Um, the When you're doing the past life regression, of course, you're going back to a source event that relates to a current life problem. And sometimes that source event for some people 
is back in a past life where they were an alien. So we have um, different people describing themselves on ships. They're out on icy planets and all kinds of things. But still, within the, the context of the regression, they're able to say they were doing something there. It can be useful to them in the now and getting that same healing, even when they're describing themselves floating around in a spaceship. Give us an example of uh, a story of somebody who had, uh, and, and did they do this in under hypnosis? Yes. We're going the same place. Um, that we would still go if we were going into ancient Egypt, but yet they're floating back. So someone, for example, floated back in time and described themselves as having a pear-shaped head, big eyes, and scaly hands, not much of a figure, and describing the fact that they didn't have many emotions, how clinical they are, and they were there um, a long, long time ago describing the fact that the beings that they were then live a lot longer than us earthlings. And so a lot of times what happens when people go back into those lives, and I've got some of this in the book as well, is they realize they were aliens then, and so sometimes they have soul contracts that they are engaging in in their current life with extraterrestrials. So perhaps in this case of, that I've just read a little bit from, um, the woman believed that she had lived as an alien. She's here now. She's helping them to survive and so in the book, I have a journey that readers can go on to go meet with extraterrestrials to see if they do have a soul contract. And I'm reminding readers that, you know, if the soul contract is good for us, again, if there's something beneficial, then that's fine. But if it's something that is non-beneficial or if we feel like we've completed our mission, then we could certainly decide that we're done with it. And so um, I've, I've had people break soul contracts, and I've had people continue the soul contracts. Shelley, we've been talking about past lives, but what about future lives? Yes. Um, since the beginning of my career, I have always taken people into the future, typically into the current life future where they can perceive themselves happy, healthy, everything's going wonderfully, and whatever the challenge was that they showed up with, after they've gone into whichever past life they need to go to and heal that, I want to take them to the future where whatever that challenging thing was, it is no longer with them. They've learned from it, and things are going great. Because we know, uh, because of quantum physics and how the multiverse works, there's multiple possibilities in our future. So why not go to the happy place? So there's um, opportunities for people to do that in this book, as well as my book we talked about in July, Journeys through the, through the Akashic Records. Some people could even go, if they want, thousands of years into the future and see if they can become the next Nostradamus as well. But um, in terms of current life healing, I think it could be super helpful to tap into future memories. Does somebody need a past life regressionist in order to get into a past life? Can you do it? at home, on your own? I really believe that people can use the journeys in my book, and that's why I'm encouraging people. I've got tons of guided journeys in here. There's over 50 in this one. I always put a lot in there, and the way I'm having people relax and go through the whole process, building on each journey, people can use recording apps in their phone, just read the journey to yourself, play the journey back, um, I also record the journeys for people who don't want to do that, but I think that we can do this, a lot of this ourselves. The soul is vast, and we know what is for our best interest, and we know the deepest secrets of our soul is simply we can open the right doors and get that information pulled out. How do we know that they really are dealing with their past lives and it's not some kind of figment of their imagination that they don't know they're doing? We really don't know that. That's the thing. Um, earlier in the show, we were talking about programming, you know, and people have always debunked past life regression by saying, well, they probably just watched a TV show and now they think they're Cleopatra or yeah, whatever. Exactly. And, you know, over the years... We do have a caller who does believe she's the reincarnated yes. Cleopatra, though. Yes, she may, I know. She it's on. so amazing. Maybe she'll call today. She knows a lot about Cleopatra. She does. It's incredible. It so, I mean, again, how do we know that's not Cleopatra? We don't. But, again, how do we know she's not figmenting her imagination? The thing is, as long as 
you know, she's always bringing through something really positive. And to me, I, you know, the, the context of the past life journey is to go in the past, release these unwanted influences, and create a positive context around things. So as long as it's a positive context that is helping the individual to make greater sense out of difficulties, heal from those, and move forward with more peace, then I don't have a problem with whether it's actually clinically proven or not. Where do p- parallel universes fit in, if at all? This, for me, does fit in. Um, I wrote a book that came out in 2005 called Beyond Reality, Evidence of Parallel Universes, and it was the first time I was on Coast to Coast AM shortly before you and I met. And um, in this book, it was describing the clients who I had regressed into parallel universes. I had a dream one night that I was driving down this strange highway and my friend was with me and it was so vivid that I called him the next day and I said, you're not going to believe this dream. And he said, oh my God, I had the same dream. And I said, you got to be kidding. And I said, I wonder if we're living in a parallel universe together. And so I started doing these experiments with people, taking them into this guided journey and then having them tell me, are you living in parallel dimensions at this time? Yes or no. And most of them said yes. Some of those um, involved taking, they would be in past lives simultaneously. Others, they were in future. And then some, they were actually living simultaneous lives in other dimensions that were happening at the same time concurrent to their current reality. And then I did a lot of experiments taking people back in time to where they made a critical decision. And every single listener who's hearing us right now, every one of us has had a point in our life in the past where we had to make a decision, it was very difficult. And then when things are going great, we go, wow, that was a great decision. And then when things are not going great, then we go, dang, you know, I wonder if I really should have done that or not. And so I took them back to the moments before these decision points, and I had them go ahead and travel out into the alternative dimension that would be created through this different decision that they made. And 100% of the time, George, they said, after going there into this other reality, they said, oh my gosh, they came back and they said, you know what, I know now for sure that the choice that I made was the correct choice. And so it let them let go of that wondering and that doubt. And it brought a lot of peace to people. It was very interesting. And so in this book, we're back to talking about that idea that, as I mentioned before, the future is up for grabs. Let's go to the happy place. And how can we tap into bringing the best possible futures and realities um, into our present moment. You know, it's it's very interesting stuff. It's pretty far out, but um, I think readers may enjoy it, Um, but it's pretty far out stuff. How did you get involved in this? Um, It really began in childhood. My mom went to a luncheon where the guest speaker was the hypnotherapist and the woman who were the subject of the book, The Search for Bridie Murphy, back in the 70s. Um, The lady had allergies and couldn't get medical relief, so she had a hypnotherapist take her back to childhood and do some healing, and it's making a little bit of progress, but he said, go back to your, you know, the source event of these allergies, and she went back into a life in Ireland, and again, she was obviously, yes, speaking of debunking, very much debunked by people who assume that she just saw that on television, but my mom bought the book and brought it home to the family dinner table when I was a little kid. And we were discussing past lives as a kid. And then later in my 20s, um, after a friend passed away, I started having a lot of visual encounters and paranormal experiences. Um, I saw him in a window. I had sensed him in different places. And after about nine years of struggling with unresolved grief, somebody suggested, hey, maybe you should have a past life regression. And I did, and I discovered that we had known each other in a few different lifetimes. And this burden, this is why I know from personal experience, when we're carrying around a burden, we're not getting any results. We've tried everything high and low. Um, The regression for me just helped me look at the reality from a totally different perspective. And I just, with a snap of a finger, I was done. I was like, you know what? I think I'm okay with this now. I understand I'm going to be okay. I wasn't to blame. We all have a time to live. We have a time to go, and it's going to be okay. And it was so profound for me that I said, I want to learn how to do this for other people. And then that's when I started doing it. 
Where does astral projection fit in here, if at all? Yeah, um, there's a lot of literature and classes out there trying to get people to learn how to do astral projection to leave the body and go travel in outer space. I think that through guided imagery, like the the processes that I offer in my books, particularly if they go back and check out the book Journeys Through the Akashic Records, which is really filled with all of the different kinds of journeys that I've taken clients on over the past 20 years, we really do end up then being able to take our consciousness out and put our consciousness in different spaces, but we're doing it a little bit more consciously than just, you know, imagining ourselves floating off. We're doing it with a little bit more structure. We're going to take calls with Shelly next hour here on Coast to Coast, so get ready to ask a question or two about past lives. It's truly remarkable. I mean, uh, it's almost a science, isn't it? It really is. It really is a process. Um, I do a lot of explaining of that as well. This is not, you know, we don't necessarily have to believe in reincarnation, although I do, but it is really a process that can be very, very effective for uncovering these memories and bringing greater peace to people's lives. And how do you prepare people for their own past lives? I mean, what about the possibility that they can't handle it emotionally? I really believe that the highest good for the person is coming through, and that's always the intention in this. So sometimes maybe there's something difficult that needs to be observed. Maybe we're going to shed a few tears, but tears are, you know, the salt of the tears is very alchemical and can really lead to great transformation. But normally, uh, let's say we're popping into the last day of someone's life and they see their death. We're just going to go there, we're going to observe it, and then the minute they observe it, we're going to lift up, 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 and just go out of that space, go back into a peaceful healing space in between lives, and get that healing. So normally we just don't really see a lot of really dramatic um, responses, but occasionally some tears, but always for highest good. Is it always a good thing when you say highest good? Is it always a good thing to know your past life? Maybe sometimes you leave well enough alone. I really think that if it's not meant for you to know them, then you will not be able to access the information during the guided imagery process. So whatever comes through during a guided imagery process, I think that the higher self of each individual, um, along with the guides that I do believe are helping us all, will determine what actually gets revealed. Some things maybe maybe they really think they want to go back and check out their life in ancient Greece, but maybe it's just not happening. That doesn't necessarily mean they didn't have one, but maybe it's just not the right time to know, or maybe it is not in their highest interest to know. I really think that what comes up is typically very healing and very timely. Do we all go back to the ancient times, Shelley? Really, we um, often go back to like the 17 or 1800s, 1600s, maybe something a little bit sooner closer to the present life. Sometimes people go back to things that happened just immediately before they came here in their current life. But um, we do, yeah, go back to ancient times as well. This book, I just wanted to focus on those ancient worlds, though, because they're so fascinating. And again, some of them are, because they're the first time, like, I've ever really written extensively about Mesopotamia and things like that. Um, The hope for doing that is to maybe get people to go back further than the 17 or 1800s. Maybe they haven't gone back there before. I think that reading about other people's stories and just opening the door historically to some of these time periods that may be unfamiliar would start to generate curiosity that may eventually be helpful to the soul journey. That would be fantastic, wouldn't it? Be interesting. Very, very interesting. I know that I've opened up a lot of different thoughts, like I mentioned earlier in the show about... um, different lives I've had in Rome, or even just thinking about deeper thoughts about Atlantis, for example. Lots of Atlantean healing regressions in this book, um, because there are so many people now that I encounter who believe that they were sent here in this current life at this time for a reason, which is to help with the healing of the planet, and that they really learned a lot of those skills back in Atlantis. Great job, by the way, Shelley. How long have you been working on this book? Oh, my gosh, a couple of years. That long? Yeah, it's a long one. I know. I mean, I wrote the forward for you a long time ago. Yeah, 
probably a year ago. Yeah, uh, at least, at least. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, this is uh, the longest nonfiction book I have ever done, and I'm working on another one now that will be even longer than this. So, well, what's that topic? Um, it's going to be, without giving away too much yet, it's a, it's kind of another take on ancestral healing, building on that other book I had called Heal Your Ancestors to Heal Your Life. Yes, that's right. But it's got a different spin to it, but I'll keep that one for a surprise. But basically ancestral stuff again. But you're becoming an expert in past lives. You know that, don't you? I see that now. It's my dream, and it's happening, yes. I guess after a while, you know, it happens. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's take some calls. You ready? Yes. Here, here you go, Cleopatra. Louise in Kentucky. Hi, Cleopatra. Hey, oh, it's Louise. It is amazing. This is my destiny to call in to... Because I had been asleep, I woke up. I said, let me see what George is talking about. You're talking about you. That's what I heard. I said, let me call in because I said I was going to rest from calling in. Because when I listen to you, it's from 1 to 5 in the morning. I've been doing that for George for as long as you've been on coast to coast. But I love you all. And God said, call in. And here I am. Well, I want Shelly to talk to you. Shelly, you got a chance to talk to Cleopatra. Go ahead. <laughs> such a joy to talk to you. How are you? Shelly, you're doing a wonderful job. And part of my job is to help people realize we all have been here before, some on this planet, some on other planets. But I'm happy to be Cleopatra. I loved her. She was such a real person in her way. And, you know, she didn't mean anyone any harm. The person who gave her the biggest problem was Octavian, because he defeated Cleopatra and Mark Anthony. And then Mark Anthony committed suicide. And I don't really remember, I can't remember what happened, but it has been 2,000, 0, 23 years ago since Cleopatra disappeared from Earth. Wow, and yet she's here through you, and that's incredible. Well, thank you for helping us all to, you know, get the story together. But I enjoy listening to you all. And you're doing a great job. But I do remember going back 16,000 years ago to Atlantis. And I was with a person called, I call him Clay, because he was, a, you know, a person that I loved greatly. And when my marriage dissolved many years ago and I went home to Kentucky, Louisville, mm -hmm. I came in touch with Clay. And he had 30 days before he was being shipped to Vietnam. Did he, and, uh, did he come back okay? Yes, he did. And when he came back, he and I were together uh, for a, a half a year. You also used to date Muhammad Ali, right? Oh, yes. Muhammad Ali was um, Caesar, Julius Caesar. And he was my first love, and he, I was his first girlfriend. So he, he must have been Cassius Clay at the time. Right? He was. Yeah. And I called him Cassius. A lot of people called him Cash, but I called him Cassius. And he told me, he said, when do I believe I can become the greatest boxer in the world. And I said, I believe you can do it, Cash. Well, he sure did. Wow, sure Louise, did. that's incredible. You're amazing. There you go, Shelly. Thanks, Louise. Thank you, George. Take care. How many people have these kinds of past life feelings, Shelly? Well, I mean, Louise is very conscious of her soul. She's I mean, tuned in. She's incredible. I think there are quite a few people who are becoming more conscious, but she's definitely at the top of the list for sure. Next up, let's go to Pauline in North Carolina. Hello, Pauline. Welcome to the show. Hi. My question is this. Whenever I see um, these uh, small cobble streets, like, uh, say, in Italy, I really feel a strong connection to that. And my question is, could that be a past life memory or a memory inherited from my ancestors? Pauline, this is excellent that you brought this up. Um, I have a book about spontaneous past life memories, which is talking about people, yes, encountering cobble streets and then having um, memories emerge. But we definitely know that those might be from past lives, but they could definitely be coming in from the ancestors. And I have talked to people who realize that memories and thoughts and feelings they were having when they did some ancestral research were coming through that as well. So if you have Italian ancestors, that's possible. It could always be both. 
So I think maybe some guided journeys could give you some answers to that. Does that help, Pauline? It does. Thank you. All right. You're very welcome. And Shelly's website, of course, is pastlifelady.com. Do you have any others or just that one, Shell? Just that one. I have shellycare.com that points to my Amazon author page. And, of course, you have Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. You're all over the place. Yes, yes. I'm definitely out out there. <laughs> are you, are you feeling that. any live events picking up since COVID? Um, I'll be doing some next year. I'm going to the Omega Institute and some other places, and that schedule hasn't been put up. I'm going to be doing something with the Shift Network at the end of the month, but that's still online. So, Have you done much TV? I've done some TV, yes. I know you I were just, one of our Beyond Belief guests. Yes, and I just came back from another show um, in Los Angeles, but I don't know when it's going to air. Next up, let's go to Walter in Pennsylvania. I'll warn you, Shell, he's a resident skeptic. Is that fair to say, Walter? Yeah, I guess, George. That's great. I love it. But we always give you the respect you deserve. <laughs> well, I thank you, George. George, I think from the standpoint of hard science, we might say that our matter is what's really immortal. Now, undoubtedly, I don't believe in, in an immortal soul. So, you know, you could say uh, the lady that just claimed that she's a reincarnation of Cleopatra, well, she may undoubtedly have matter, molecules and atoms in her body that were once part of Cleopatra. Well, George, and as far as the near-death experience uh, issue, uh, if I told Tom, if you look at the example of Ted Williams, now he's been dead for decades, technically, but he's in a state of cryogenic suspension, I think. Well, his, he, he, his uh, head is, his body. They, they removed his head from his body, and they've got his head in his brain in a cryogenic chamber. So you might say, George, that his EKG and his EEG is slowed to such a slow degree that, you know, is he, is he dead or alive, George? I mean, George, to me, even if they did dead. bring him back in a thousand years and he was you, you really still couldn't trust his brain to say that, well, he was in a, he was brought back from heaven or wherever. You know what I mean? That's true. So you don't believe in reincarnation? Well, George, as I say, uh, you know, Einstein, E equals MC squared. Our matter, you might say, is immortal. All right. Thanks, Walter. And Shelley, I want to give you an opportunity to rebut him. Well, I mean, I think Walter's making some interesting points. I mean, the idea of matter and the fact that, you know, we probably did breathe the same air as Plato and Socrates and all of these other historical figures. So, I mean, I do think there's something to that. I definitely do believe, though, in the continuation of the soul. And I think the best place that we all get to learn that lesson is if we show up to the funeral home and we can clearly see that our beloved friend or whoever it is is just simply no longer there. There's a shell they have gone. Where did they go? And, you know, there's just too many miraculous stories for me to believe otherwise. And of all the past lives of ancient lands, which ancient land would you say might have been the most progressive at the time? Well, I believe Atlantis was a real place. Some people don't, but I would say I do Atlantis too. I do too. was the most progressive, yes. They were very highly um, technological. They had it all going on until greedy individuals apparently blew the place up with some crystals. So that was probably top of the game. Um, Egypt, obviously incredible. Um, you, you even see sophistication in Mesopotamia. Perhaps, you know, there were extraterrestrial gods visiting them as well. So, but in terms of just sheer flash, Atlantis has the, all of the other ones beat. Let's go to Nan in Virginia. Welcome to the show. Hi, Nan. Uh, hello. I have electromagnetic hypersensitivity. Do you deal with clients who cannot use a computer? Wow, I haven't heard of that exact syndrome. So you're saying you're so sensitive that you can't be around the computer at all? I bet you turn out uh, street lights, don't you, Nan? Yes. <laughs> yes. I knew it. I knew it. Go wow. ahead. Go ahead, Shell. Um, I have never worked with anyone with that before. I, I do think as a societal whole, though, that we're so bombarded with the frequencies of lighting and, and screens and monitors that 
sometimes I think people get something called a frequency sickness, that's what I call it, where you just have to shut everything off and go get in bed. I think everybody has it to a certain degree, but it just sounds like you have really been affected by that. So, Yeah, there are some people who have this incredible ability as they walk by street lights, they go on and off. When they wow. come up close, they go off, and when they keep walking, they go back on. It sounds weird. like uh, psychokinetic energy or something. Yeah, it's it's strange. They have this incredible ability. We have Sherry in California, west of the Rockies. Hey, Sherry, go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Sure um, thing. Well, I have a question. Ever since I was a little girl, I used to tell my grandmother that I didn't feel like I belonged on the planet Earth, so to speak, that I just felt like... I really didn't belong here, and she would always say, no, honey, you belong here. You belong here. But I I always felt kind of disconnected like from um, some other place. Yeah, and I, I've always been kind of drawn to the ocean um, or or even, you know, worlds far off like, you know, space, but more drawn to the ocean, I think. And I've had, um, you know, spiritual experiences with, like, dolphins in Mexico and that sort of thing that were like pretty bizarre, quite honestly, where like I ran up on a breeding ground of dolphins on a ship and they were, you know, out there for as far as the eye could see. And then, um, you were a mermaid in another life. (laughs) I don't know about (laughs) that, but I, I don't know. Do we have like, uh, the ability even as children to know that we maybe we're from some sort of past world or past life. Is that she couldn't have been from another like planet. That? What do you think, Shelley? Yeah, Sherry. I mean, this is um, a similar feeling that I've heard from so many people over the many years. This idea that we're disconnected, we don't belong. You know, they didn't do stuff like this on the place where I came from, and this isn't it. And your attraction to dolphins, I mean, it sounds like you may have... Um, you may have been in Atlantis. You could have been in Lemuria. Good point. Some other planet. Um, it sounds a lot like, like even in the ancient lands book, in this book, and in the part three, um, I'm taking people into that place of before we arrived and into that space of timeless being. Good luck. Jim Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Hey, Jimmy, go ahead. Good morning, uh, George Shelley. Uh, my question is about Ted Williams and uh, his head being frozen. Okay. Wouldn't that ultimately be the the definition of a sensory deprivation tank that could be that that could be and what what they plan to do and the reason they've done this is they are hoping that one day when they get cloning of bodies done and downloading of memories done that they would be able to do that they would clone his body so you'd have the physical body of Ted Williams and then they download the memory of his real frozen head into the new person, and he'd have the memory of Ted Williams. It's remarkable, Shelley. I don't know if they're ever going to be able to do that, but they're trying. Wow. I mean, it is incredible. It gets into the whole philosophical discussion about, you know, where is the soul during all this? You know, is it just floating around over this head that's sitting in a cryogenic container, or where did it go? But I think it's going to be fascinating to see what happens. If you were to live your life all over again, maybe in a past life or a future life, would you still do the same thing? Wow, that's an interesting question. I think I would. You love this. Yeah, I really would do it. Because there was a real specific time when I, you know, left being a regular person behind. (laughs) Didn't we have an interview a long time ago, maybe one of the first, on stones? Yeah, yeah. I remember that. Yeah, I wrote a lot of stones. You wrote a book on stones. I grew up, um, my dad worked for the turquoise mines that Edgar Cayce visited during his lifetime. So I still love stones. Everybody's like, why don't you write about that anymore? I really wanted to get my past life thing going, but I still use gems and stones. I still think they assist us in so many different things. And um, that, that was weird, though, because the stones to me is like how I grew up. I grew up you know, hiking and camping and rock hounding and stuff like that. That's kind of like a hobby. And I didn't know anyone was even going to like my books on stones. And so that was kind of a surprise. Whereas the past life regression was really always what I actually wanted to do professionally. But I found that they they go together because you do still need energy healing to address 
the thought forms and the energetic component that goes along with memories from past lives and other things. So um, I think it's been super interesting, and I, I definitely would continue to do this, yeah. I'm, uh, Shelley, once again, where do people get your book? Got a couple minutes left here. Um, people can come check out pastlifelady.com. The book's right there. I have a class. If you order the book and you email your receipt to me, you can receive this free class where I take you on a past life regression, and I talk about all the chapters in the book. You do it by Zoom? It's on my online platform. So the, the class was recorded last weekend, so I just enroll people into the class, and they can watch it, and it takes them on a past life regression. And it's free with your book purchase. Well, that's perfect. And, of course, you can sign up on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. Absolutely. Shelley, when's the next book done? Um, by the grace of God, this next thing I'm working on better be done by the beginning of December, this one that's been taking years and years to write. So, so book yourself again with us, would you? I would love to. And that's to. ready to come out, and uh, it was a pleasure writing the forward to this book. That was fun. I'm so grateful to you for your friendship, your support over the years. It's just meant the world to me. I've loved this show. I think it's the best thing that has ever happened to humanity, how you're helping people. You're giving them a space to talk about these things, and you know nobody else was going to do it. So thank you. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.